Greetings all y'all. Welcome to Tea and Storytime with your host, Pika Scribit, a purveyor of baked goods and fine fiction. Today I'm enjoying green tea with honey, which I'm sort of developing a taste for, which is good since a friend of mine got me a pound of the stuff. <laughs> all right, yesterday we did Slally's birthday party and everything seemed to be going really sort of unexpectedly well. And uh, we can't have that, can we? So, chapter 11. And her rag doll. The shade in Helga's bedroom billowed slightly in the pre-dawn breeze, then sank back against the window frame. The darkness in the sleeping girl's mind was coagulating into a shape. She lay on her back in white short-sleeved pajamas, her hair coiled on the pillow. Her arms were spread like those of a supplicating victim. Her face was turned toward the window. Ombra, the craftsman, lifted a rag doll from the rubble of Helga's half-remembered childhood and laid it upon the stage of her dreams. The bit of wool that had pinched the body into a neck was gone. So was one of the eyes, made from an overcoat button. But the remaining eye, black as coal, stared at her. The doll lay in a corner. Helga whispered a name and rolled over. Her long, supple body bent into an S. Her hands were gathered close to her mouth. Ombra murmured an old love song. The song came from behind the closed door of her parents' bedroom in a sultry evening. Bentley rode his bicycle in the bright sunshine. He stopped and invited Helga to a party. Bentley and Slally sat on Bentley's bed. The black-eyed doll was in the toy box. When Helga got the doll, it would lead her home. A young man named Kurt raised his hand to her face as they lay with no clothes on. Helga tasted the tip of his thumb. She opened her eyes and took the tip of her thumb from her mouth. She was awake, but her dreams went on. Wearily, she remembered that she had to find her cat and her rag doll to get back her happiness. She rolled over onto her stomach and lay for a moment holding the pillow. Slowly, she raised herself to her hands and knees. The rag doll waited in the shadowed corner, a one-eyed promise. Puchki mewed at her, from, um, mewed for her in the forest, where the sun was rising. Morning was coming as she gently shook Kurt. Liebesherz, she whispered. Wurst. Bentley leaned forward, at, against the handle of his uh, handlebars of his bicycle, and said to her. It's in the toy box. Helga nodded and moved to the edge of the bed. She put her bare feet on the floor and threw her hair back with a toss of her head. For a moment she sat still, remembering the face of her cat peering from the shrubbery and the doll's one black eye. Helga walked slowly down the hall so as not to awaken, to awaken her parents. It's in the toy box, Bentley said again giving his bicycle a shove and pedaling away in the hot afternoon. Helga loved him and reached out to touch him. Kurt slept on. Somewhere in the blaze of sunrise, she heard Puchki crying. She walked past Bentley's bed. She gathered up his rumpled sheet from the floor. She held it against her breast and looked down at the sleeping boy, curled, up, up in, or curled in upon himself. Gently, she unfurled the sheet and watched it float down, covering him. She bent over and kissed him goodbye. Now I am going to be homesick for you, she murmured, but I must go back. They are waiting for me, darling child. To go back. It was the commandment of God. Back to the twisting streets of Munich and the spring fragrance of the, of the English garden. They were calling her from the lakes, the green hills, the pure forests of Bavaria, where the Isar ran more swiftly than any other river and Seraphim sang in the bells of Easter against the foggy sky. Bentley stirred. Kurt, her first love, stirred, calling her away from the land where the shore faces east, calling her back uh, to the rapture and the country where the clocks had stopped and peace had come at last. There she would find the cat and her lost happiness. The one-eyed doll would show the way. This God promised her. She crossed the room silently on bare feet and opened the toy box. 
The doll's eyes stared at her, black but glittering with the light that would lead her home. Helga reached into the toy box and picked up the stone. She recrossed the bedroom and gently closed the door. Walking softly, she went downstairs, one hand sliding along the smooth banister, the other clutching the stone. She went through the living room and pushed open the screen door. The world spread new before her, as if she had just been born. She heard the chorus of awakening birds. She saw the splendors of creation in the green of high summer, the thick foliage of the forest, and the stalks and branches of shrubbery glistened in the rising sun touched by a billion, touched a billion droplets of dew. On the perimeter of the cold sea, the real sun was the color of a bleeding wound. Helga went down the porch steps. The grass was wet beneath her feet. She heard her cat calling in the woods where it had been lost long, long ago. Helga looked toward the path that ran through the forest. The sun was glowing on the perimeter of her vision, but despite its brilliance, she saw the cat's face. Its large eyes stared at her from the tall grass at the edge of the forest. Its mouth opened in a low yowl. It looked starved. Pushki, whispered the girl. The cat turned and vanished into the brush, leaving only a quivering milkweed that scattered droplets of dew. She walked, then ran toward the brush line. The forest floor was rough. Her feet pressed upon stones and roots. Branches tore at her, ripping her pajamas and scratching her flesh. Pushki, she cried. The cat stood between two pine trees on a flat shelf of mossy rock. Its starved eyes beckoned her forward. Helga threw out her arms to it, one fist still holding the stone. The cat crouched, trembling as she walked toward it. Puchki, she said softly, trying to persuade it not to be frightened. The bobcat leapt. The pain of Helga's yearning became the pain of death. The promise had been false. God had not made it. As the bobcat's claws tore at her head and its teeth sank into her neck, she fell. A monstrous being filled the forest. It watched with a blood-red eye that shone through the foliage. The last thing Helga saw was the eye of the promiser, the hideous god. The last thing she felt was the bobcat's jaws crushing her fist and snatching the stone from her broken fingers. Dietrich Christein stood in the forest clearing. McGraw was opposite him on the other side of the blanket-covered body. Dr. Christein wore pajamas and a heavy robe. He raised one gnarled hand and idly fingered the wart on top of his head. McGraw's cruiser was parked in Dr. Christine's back lawn. Its red roof light whirled and flashed. Another Stonehaven police cruiser was parked behind it. An ambulance was in the driveway. People from neighboring houses had gathered on the road. Ellen and Slally and Bentley were halfway down the path that led through the woods to Dr. Christine's house. McGraw finished writing something in his notebook. Anything else? Dr. Christine pursed his lips. Yeah, he said quietly. Secondary lacerations to the right arm. The right hand has been partially destroyed. He looked at McGraw. I am not a pathologist, but I think you will find that it, it is as I have told you. The wounds on the head and throat caused her death. Was it quick? Richard asked. He was standing near them with his hands shoved into the rear pockets of his blue jeans. Dr. Christine looked at him. I'm sorry, Richard said. He lowered his head so that the old man couldn't see the tears in his eyes. It is a natural question, Dr. Christine said. Do not feel embarrassed. I think she died very quickly. McGraw closed his notebook and put it in his shirt pocket. Seems like it was a bobcat, all right, he said. A hunter was killed by one last year. Dr. Christine turned to him. Please, what is this bobcat? A wild cat, McGraw said. He looked down at the blanket draped over Helga's body and remembered his sense of foreboding the evening before. Don't see too many of them around here. Their loners usually stick to their own hunting territory. And such an animal is large enough to do... The old man bent and pulled the blanket over Helga's extended bare foot. This? McGraw nodded. Yep, a bobcat can, can kill somebody. A big cat weighs, oh, 30, 35 pounds. I expect this one went off its head. What was Helga doing out here at 5.30 in the morning? Richard asked for the third time. This, said Dr. Christine, is a very interesting question. 
Please, Professor, take the children away from here. They have already seen too much. He flapped his hand. Go, now. I will visit them later. Richard nodded. He went back up the path through the woods, taking Ellen, Slowly, and Bentley with him. Uh. And you didn't hear anything? McGraw asked Dr. Christie. The old man shook his head. No, and this is curious. I am a very light sleeper. I always wake at the sunrise. Something kept me asleep this morning until you knocked on the door. McGraw was about to ask him what he meant by curious and something. Then the police chief remembered his encounter with Willie Bill. Never again would McGraw react with instant scorn to anything that smacked of mystery. Okay, Eddie, he said to one of the ambulance men standing in the driveway. Let's get her out of here. Dr. Christine climbed the porch steps of the house, holding his, loose, uh, his loosening bathrobe belt. He hadn't needed to see Helga's body to know what had happened. He had seen it in Bentley's face as he stood beside Ellen on the path. The boy knew that Prince Ombra had re-entered the world. Breathing heavily, Dr. Christine stopped on the porch. He turned and looked at the malicious sparkle of the sun through the high foliage. He gasped several times until his breathing was easier and his heart had slowed. Poor, poor child, he muttered. He squinted at the pinpoints of sunlight. So, Umbra, you have returned in an even more terrible form. The slayer of the mighty vanquisher of Kukulin, the fire-headed. You, um, you have seen this girl destroyed as part of a new plan, I presume. You do not even consider this a murder. To you, it is just a first move. He took a handkerchief from his bathrobe and cleared his throat. But to us, the mortals who live a life that is shorter but more complete than yours, this is the slaughter of an innocent, and you will suffer for it. Already, I know why it was done. He spat in contempt, turned, and walked slowly into the house, letting the screen door bang behind him. Suffer! taunted a voice in the depths of the sea. What suffering will you deliver on me, magician? I am the Pontiff Maximus of all suffering. When Dr. Christine had bathed and dressed and made a pot of tea, the lawn, forest, and sea had resumed their normal pattern. But, as he stood with a cup of tea on the porch, he felt the other menacing presence within the pattern. He heard yelling. He looked into the woods. Bentley was running toward him on the path, you gotta come quick, he cried. There's something wrong with Slally. The old man put his teacup down carefully. Bentley stopped at the bottom of the porch steps. And something else has... Calm yourself, Dr. Christine said. Already one terrible event has happened today. We must prepare ourselves for more. I know that your stone is gone. Bentley's eyes widened. How did you know? Dr. Christine hesitated for a moment, then he decided that it was best that the boy be told. Helga's hand, he whispered quietly. The fingers were broken. This means she was holding something in her fist, and the animal did considerable damage getting it. He looked closely at Bentley. How do you feel? Terrible, Bentley said. Helga's dead. He brushed one eye with his fingers. It is a good thing to cry, Dr. Christine said, coming heavily down the porch steps. It is, it is one of the reasons why our eyes were given such equipment. You have lost somebody dear to you. It is proper that you should cry. Bentley raised his head. I'm not supposed to. And who told you this, please? I just know, Bentley said, a miserable expression on his face. What is wrong with Sally? She can't talk, Bentley said, his mouth trembling. She can't make a sound. The old man nodded. So the ripples widen, and somebody else is injured. He took his clean handkerchief from his pocket. If you are not supposed to cry, you will, can still wipe your eyes and blow your nose. Go inside. My medicine bag is in the library. There is no rush. And I think I'll stop there and make another video.